Oh, okay, let's move, let's move this but to this, the discussion. But, but, this is no longer a Okay, no, no, I do want to have that argument. I misunderstood your question, but, but we'll take that okay. to the... Well, Andy Dessler is next. I'll give you time two minutes before. Great, you. great. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to change gears a little bit, um, and I'm going to talk about what we can learn about ECS uh, from short-term variations. And just a comment that um, uh, people casually dismiss ENSO as a source of information, like, well, ENSO is not climate change. And my argument could be that's a mistake, that there's actually a lot of good information in ENSO cycles about what the climate sensitivity is. Um, so uh, let's begin. I don't think anyone's shown this equation. Uh, just joking. Um, so the first thing to do, the most naive thing you can do, is you can take an equation that looks like this, and we measure top of atmosphere flux from Ceres and um, temperature we can get from Mira. And forcing is basically small over the Ceres period. It's not correlated with surface temperature, so it doesn't really matter. And you can regress them. And you, you can come up with the, the slope is, is lambda total. And that's really what you want to find, by the way. You know, we're trying to find lambda. And if you do that, um, I think Dick Lindzen described this plot as grotesque. Uh, I actually agree with him on that. Um, uh, you know, the data aren't great. They, these are, by the way, monthly average, global average, and as Graham pointed out yesterday, there's probably ways you can prettify this. But nonetheless, this is sort of the classic framework that you do it. And this is similar to what Forster and Gregory did, although I think the series data are a lot better than the Irby data they use, and I don't have Pinatubo to deal with. Um, uh, and so you can fit a line through it, and you see that one error bar is pretty close to zero, no correlation. <laughs> Where, uh, but uh, if you look at it, you can kind of see there is a positive slope to it, sort of in agreement with what the least squares fit goes. And if you run the fit, you get about minus one watts per square meter per degree Kelvin. So that's sort of the first estimate. Now, the problem with this estimate is that it is in response to short-term climate variations. This is, N, this is a response to ENSO. But what you really want is the, response, the lambda in response to long-term warming. And there's no guarantee those are the same. They might be the same. They might not be the same. You just don't know. And so what you want to do then is you want to say, how can I figure out if this is representative of the lambda in response to 100-year warming of 100-year um, of, uh, emission of carbon dioxide and the associated warming? Well, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take a bunch of control runs. Now, the control runs from the CMIP-5 have no forcing in them, and so they're comparable to the series data. Most of the temperature variations of series data are internally generated. The change in forcing over that period is really very small. Um, and then I'm going to take a bunch of RCP 8.5 runs, which have massive amounts of forcing in them. And I'm going to calculate lambda exactly the same way. And, and all the models, I'm just going to regress R minus F versus delta T from both sets of models. And this is going to give me a relationship between what the lambda from uh, ENSO versus the lambda from long-term warming is. Yeah, so I assume it ramps linearly from 2.3 to 8.5 watts. I'm only, I'm, uh, I'm only analyzing 2006 to 2100, and that's essentially what I'm doing. And I've compared the lambda I get to Andrew's GRL paper 2012, and I get pretty close values, except for my rock 5. But I, I'm getting pretty good values for that. Anyway, so here's, here's what I get. And you see there's a correlation. So, it, so the zeroth order, it tells you that if you know what lambda is from this, which we can measure with series, it will tell you what lambda is from this, at least within the uncertainties, et cetera. And so if I put... Yeah, so monthly average deseasonalized, yes. That's correct. Monthly average anomalies. Um, and again, for the RCP, 2006 to 2100. And for I used almost all of the control runs. I used the first 500 years of the control runs. All right, so if we put... If we put the series data on there, the series data is now the blue line, and then the gray is the error bars. Um, you know, it doesn't really exclude, I guess it excludes one model. Um, but, it, you know, it's not a very tight constraint. It, admittedly, it's not a tight constraint on the models. Um, but nevertheless, we can use this to try to infer what lambda is. So we can, set, we can fit a line to this. We'll fit a line to the models to give us a, a relationship with the models, and then we can sort of say, okay, well, if this line tells me the relation between this lambda and this lambda is, then I can come over here, and that tells me what lambda is for long-term warming using the models as a predictor. I mean, I'm using the models here as, as a prediction of this. 
And basically it gives me a 1.23 plus or minus 0 0.6. And so what I say is this is uh, the, the series estimate based on what I've gone through of, of, the, of the lambda. And if you use a stratosphere adjusted forcing of 3.7 watts, that gives you 3 plus or minus 1.4. I sort of look at that and you go, you know, it's, it's if only it was 3 plus or minus 1.5. Uh, alas, it was 1.4. So I think we should revise everything we're... No. All right. Uh, okay, so, all right, so <laughs> let's think... What? <laughs> That's right. Um, all right, so what's the advantage of this? Okay, so the, the first thing to realize, and this is a big advantage over other estimates of the 20th century, is that it doesn't require you to know the forcing in great detail, because the forcing didn't change much over this period. And it doesn't require you to know the ocean heat content. Because uh, you can measure the TOA flux from satellite. And those are two things that we really don't know very well, I would argue. And um, it's, it's sort of the, the handicap of these tw estimates of 20th century <coughs> estimates. Uh, you know, we know all of these quantities. But, now, the problem with... But, yep. but, but hey, you're using series defects. That's right. That has ocean heat content. Right? Um, it, you do know you know ocean heat content. Only uh, yeah, they use, I'm using the gradient in that. So they use it to set the absolute value. That's what it's tied to. But if you didn't do it, I'm just looking at the, at the derivative of it with surface temperature. I don't think that actually enters into it. Yeah, they tie it to one point, to the average. Well, we can talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, got, I got other stuff to talk about. So now, but the problem is this does require your knowledge of lambda from the models for short term versus long term. And so before you sort of take this as, as, as sort of take this as the final result, you want to develop confidence. Do you believe that the what the model's uh, predicting here for long term versus short term? And so what, the way we're going to look at that is again, I'm going to put this equation up. Um, and what, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our total, which is the total TOA flux, and I'm going to break this into constituents. I'm going to break, you know, we know what, what regulates top of atmosphere flux. It's temperature, it's water vapor, it's clouds. That's the thing. So we're going to break it. And I'm going to use radiative kernels, which I'm not going to talk about. Ask Mark Zelenka if you need to know more about radiative kernels. Um, and so, so I'm going to decompose the total flux. I can do that in observations, and I'm going to do that in the models. And then I'm going to regress that each uh, component against temperature. And that gives me the individual lambda terms or the individual feedbacks. And it turns out that if I add up these individual feedbacks that I get from breaking this up and regressing the temperature, then I get lambda total. And so what I'm going to try to do then is I'm going to look at the individual terms. And if they all look reasonable, then I think you can conclude that the lambda is reasonable. But looking at lambda as a whole doesn't really tell you that much. But if you look at the individual terms, you can say, OK, well, this makes sense, and this makes sense, this makes sense. So the sum of it kind of makes sense. Um, and, and I'm going to do it. Um, and I'm going to do it in control runs and in RCP 8.5 runs and in observations. And uh, for people that are uh, the glitterati of feedbacks, I'm using the held in shell decomposition, and that's similar to the standard decomposition, except uh, the Planck feedback in, in normally is just a uniform warming of the surface and atmosphere. But the way Isaac and Karen did it. They have specific humidity changing to keep relative humidity constant. There's some real advantages to doing it this way. Similarly, the lapse rate is a differential warming of the surface of the atmosphere, again, with constant relative humidity. And then you have a term that's the TOA change just due to change in relative humidity. So compared to the regular decomposition, the water vapor feedback is basically split between these two feedbacks. And there is no water vapor feedback in this. And, and I think I'll show you in a minute why this is the superior way to look at the problem. Um, and then albedo and clouds, oops. albedo and clouds are just the same. All right, so let's start looking at non-cloud feedbacks. So these are non-cloud feedbacks from the control runs. You have the Planck, lapse rate, relative humidity, and the albedo feedbacks. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on there um, the ensemble average and the value you get from Mira. So the second to last column is the average, two standard deviations of the average, and this is the Mira of what I'll, what I'll consider to be the observational estimate of the feedbacks. And um, you see they agree quite well. And this, more than anything else, gives me great confidence in the models. Uh, there's, no there's no reason for the model to be getting these right, except, uh, put it a little different. I'll just put it that way. It gives you confidence in the models.
that it breaks down the TOA flux as we would expect it to do. Um, and they'll only put the RCP models on. And you can see that the feedback strength in the RCP models is very similar to the feedback strength in the control runs. So if you can measure the feedback in one, that gives you a pretty good idea of what the feedback in, in, the, in response to short-term climate variations. So this sort of elevates the usefulness of our estimates of short-term feedbacks. Um, and so let's go through some physics about why these numbers are believable. Because I've sort of shown you these numbers, but, but again, I want to make simple physical arguments that these things are right. And so the first one, the first reason to believe this is that there's good agreement between the control runs and the MIRA uh, observations. That gives me great confidence that the models are doing the right thing. Um, all right, the Planck feedback. So the Planck feedback is basically set by the pattern of surface warming. If you get the pattern of surface warming right, then you get the atmospheric warming because they're by construction equal. And if you get the amount of atmospheric warming, then you get the change in water vapor, because that's as clouds as clapper on, because it maintains constant relative humidity. So, if, so um, uh, and the, the agreement between the control runs and the RCP runs shows that it's not very sensitive to the pattern of warming. And so I think the Planck feedback, we can have very high confidence is correct. But I see no way that's not correct. Um, what, what number is that? I'm just confused. It's just it's minus, it's minus, it's a minus 1.9. Yes, global average. So the reason it's not minus three is because it has, because it's not minus three is because it has constant relative humidity. And the, relative, and the increase in water vapor, uh, uh, okay, right. Okay, um, all right, relative humidity. So relative humidity, we have good, argu simple arguments that relative humidity should be constant. Um, we have observations that relative humidity about remains constant, and the models reproduce constant relative humidity. And so I think we can be very, very confident in this estimate uh, uh, of a near zero relative humidity feedback because, because you know, everything suggests that that's what it ought to be. Um, lapse rate. So again, the lapse rate in this decomposition is this cancellation between um, a warming atmosphere, which radiates more, and higher water vapor, which cancels. And so you get, you get a, a feedback which is close to zero, and you see that there is some tendency of the magnitude, uh, some difference in the magnitude depending on which run, but in both cases are close to zero. And this shows you the advantage of the held and shell decomposition. These two feedbacks are by construction very close to zero, and they sort of add, add a very small term. So it's mainly this feedback, uh, the, pl the Planck feedback, that really determines the system. And then you have the uh, 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 ice albedo feedback. We know ice melts at zero, so the feedback should be positive, warmer planet, you expect to see less ice. Um, we don't have a theory as to why the magnitude is what it is, like we do, for example, relative humidity. But the agreement between the um, observations uh, 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 and the control run, the good agreement there gives me some confidence that, that, uh, that the models are doing a good job and we should believe the long-term feedback here. Uh, it seems very likely, if you do say, well, what are the uncertainties? It seems very likely the long-term feedback would be a lot smaller than predicted here. It could be larger. Okay, so what does this do for us? Oh, okay, so we should have confidence in the model's abilities to simulate these feedbacks. And this is actually important because what we can do is we can add these feedbacks together, and this gives us the fixed cloud lambda. This is the lambda that would exist if clouds didn't change, or if the cloud feedback were zero. And remember, if you, or if you, and not remember, but if you add these up, you get about minus 1.87, and this is the two standard deviation the ensemble, and this translates to an ECS of about two, 1.8 to 2.2 degrees. And so Bjorn was saying he sort of wants limits, um, and so the way I think about it is this is one limit. If there were no clouds, or clouds were fixed, we would have a climate sensitivity of about two. And we would know that with pretty high precision. It, there wouldn't be a lot of, there's not a lot of uncertainty in that. At least in my judgment, there's not a lot of uncertainty. And so you can think of that as the foundation, and clouds add on to that. Whatever clouds do adds to the two degree foundation that all the other, what? One minute. One minute, oh. All right, I'll go through the rest of it pretty quickly. Um, are you sure Miles didn't use some of my time? Um, all right, so let's talk about clouds. So clouds are going to add on to whatever we do. And um, this is some work that my colleague uh, Ch uh, Chen Zhou has done. He works with Steve Klein and Mark Zelenka 
And he's the one who noted that there's a strong correlation in the cloud feedback, in the control run, and in the RCP 8.5 run. You can see that, a very strong correlation. So whatever the cloud feedback predicted in the short term gives you some information, the models at least, about the long term run. Now we can put the observations on there, and that's essentially what you get. So uh, this is the Mira plus series estimate, and this is the ensemble average of all the models. You see they agree, they agree quite well. And I think that there's um, uh, you know, some points. There, there's good agreement between the ensemble average, and that gives you some confidence in the system. Um, so given that, um, I think that the coral, because the models do such a good job getting the control, the control runs of the models doing such a good job, I think you have to take this correlation seriously. It's hard to prove it, but you should take it seriously. And I think that arguments exist. What we, we don't have an overarching theory of clouds and what the cloud feedback should be, but arguments exist as to why the cloud feedback should be positive. Individual elements, like Zelenka and Hartman's argument about as the climate warms, <coughs> high clouds go up, and that gives you a positive long wave tropical feedback. And I, there are other arguments. You know, storm tracks move poleward. That gives you a positive short wave feedback. And um, uh, I'm going through this quickly. So I say, so, so my, my conclusion, I think it was backed up. It's hard to argue against, is that the cloud feedback is very likely positive. It's certainly likely positive and you know, according to IPCC words, I would say it's very likely. Nine out of ten chance it's positive. Uh, now, the best estimate's pretty large. I don't know the extent to which I believe in that. But, um, and so second to last slide. So what does this tell us about ECS? All right, so now we can get to the final, the final calculation of ECS. So remember, the fixed clouds was minus 1.87. That's what you'd get without clouds changing. And that translates to about two degrees Celsius. And if we add cloud, the lambda cloud to it, then we get the total, uh, we'll get lambda total. And so if, it's, if you take the best estimate into account, you get 3.5 plus or minus 1.6. I'm not sure the extent to which I believe that number, but I tell you what I do believe, and that's if clouds, if lambda cloud is greater than zero, then it suggests the ECS is greater than two. And I do believe that. I think that is at least likely and perhaps very likely, uh, maybe even extremely likely. Um, I mean, I, have, I, have, I find it very difficult for some, I'd like to hear someone make an argument that the cloud feedback is negative. Um, and so my conclusions, just very quickly, um, analysis of series TOA flux implies an ECS of about three. Um, with fixed clouds, I think this is an important conclusion, with fixed clouds it would be about two. And I think we have, I, I, my personal opinion is I have very high confidence in that number. And then evidence of, uh, of a positive cloud feedback suggests it's greater than two. Thanks. Thank you.